So, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome in this great event and I would like to also give a bit of a heads up on what are we going to speak about today. Uh, different ways of uh, doing business and uh, the session is about to be a bit of a provocative. We have four experts here, all from different areas. Um, I would like to introduce them. Mihaela uh, from Dale Carnegie, uh, who's been running this company for some time already, and then also being uh, an expert in training and delivering HR consultants to clients. We have Dragos, as you probably have seen him as a president of ABSL, but at this moment, he's in a function of head of transition in Stefanini. And then we also have Andre, who is an uh, expert in fashion and retail, started his career off in advising people on how to dress. And right now he's uh, investing in fashion, as I said, owner of some brands like Gucci in Romania. And we have also Brian, who is managing partner of Wolf Ties, which is obviously a huge law firm, so a bit of a different industry. Brian has been in Romania for more than 16 years, I guess. 23, sorry for my English then. No. Oh. <laughs> yeah. no, I, I, I mispronounce numbers sometimes when I'm nervous, so that's why, but obviously I'm at 23. So, um, what we are going to speak about is how we are doing business differently, and one part of the business is also how we dress up. I would like to ask your uh, support with the first topic. Can I please have a quick of a survey in the audience? Can you please raise your hand if you feel that dressing for this event, for this conference, was important and it really meant for you how you get dressed for today. Can I see the hands who thinks this way? Very well dressed people, but I can still, not everyone thinking this way. And then let me twist this a bit around. Can you also raise the hand if you think that dressing for everyday office environment really matters? Wow, okay. So the topic is valid, good, we are assured on this. Uh, and I would like to start this discussion by having Andre, who is an expert in, in, in dressing. Can you please, Andre, define for us what is dress code, actually? Thank you for the question. Um, dress code is basically a set of um, unspoken rules that, if you're aware of, you can use them to adapt to different contexts in your life and adapt the way you look and the way you dress for that context. Uh, be it a super formal context, being a business context, or being just a, a meeting with friends. Uh, what I believe, unfortunately, is that most of us come to, um, to, to find out what dress code is through corporate situations. So, for example, we get a job and we are told to dress in a specific way. And then that doesn't feel good because somebody tells us what to do, and then we associate that with dress code. But basically, dress code is a set of guidelines that if you are aware of, you can use them and adapt your image to, to serve your, your purpose. Okay, thank you for that. So first question, we go to Dragos. Dragos, you joined Stefanini, which is obviously a huge organization. 16 years ago, again, I tried this number. 12. 12 years ago. <laughs> so can you please explain to me how is dress code? But yeah, thank you for giving me up. I'm gonna be with you at least four more years now. I'm sorry. Give you a credit, you heard it here. But can you explain to us, please, how is dress code taken in Stefanini nowadays and how it was when you joined? Well, <laughs> I, I'm not the best person to ask, to be fair. Um, I was never pro dress code. I didn't really, I, well, within company guidelines, I abided by it, but well, I, I'm seeing already a no in the audience from my colleagues. Uh, yeah, I've been to work in a suit. I've been to work in my Metallica t-shirt. I don't know, I don't really care. <laughs> Okay. I, I would say dress for the occasion, not follow a certain dress code. Like How many percent it. of the time you guys as employees of the company are dressing formal, let's say, as business formal? <coughs> Whenever there's a business formal requirement to do so. <laughs> okay. Wow, yeah, so I assume you're a very flexible company in this regard. Very flexible in this regard, yeah. Okay. Brian, you are obviously in a, in a more formal environment. We can call that you are in a, in a law firm. Um, I would like to ask you, has it ever happened to you before that you had a new colleague, an associate, joining your organization, you went for a client meeting together and that new employee turned up to that client meeting dressed inappropriately? No. <laughs> no, we have uh, pretty, pretty strict requirements. I mean, I, 
think about when I started out 30 years ago, uh, it wasn't a question of you know what you wore, but but how much money you could afford starting out to get a nice suit and tie. I actually remember my my first suit I bought at a thrift shop, and unfortunately it, it tore apart fairly quickly thereafter. But I think it's important you have to consider the profession also, as you've noted, as a law firm, you're often client facing. So what I do allow is if the associates don't want to come dressed formally, if they have to work, if they've got to get a memo memorandum done, but if they have to keep a, a suit and tie or a jacket and tie in the office. For, for guys, this works because um, if, if someone shows up unexpectedly and you have to drag them into a meeting, they can put a tie on and a jacket on. Um, generally, the women in our office just uh, dress professionally anyway, so um, that's, that's not, not really an issue. But for the guys, sometimes they show up, especially on Friday. And uh, you know, when I was starting out, casual Friday had just sort of started out in Los Angeles, like a lot of trends moves from the West Coast to the East Coast. And uh, you know, but still, you couldn't wear a T-shirt. About the best I got away with was a Hawaiian shirt uh, <laughs> underneath my blazer. But uh, can you imagine a law firm? How many years would you need to a law firm to change su such an organization culture when people are coming on and off in T-shirts and jeans? Uh, it well, it, 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 if if an associate starts out, they kind of understand that there's a dress code. I think we have seen an evolution of the legal profession. Certainly, it's more casual now. I was in Los Angeles for meetings a year ago, and I, I was sort of astounded to see the number of people walking down the street who were not wearing suits and ties, and this was the middle of a business day in downtown Los Angeles. If anyone's been there, they know you don't go to downtown LA unless you want to do business. Uh, there's no other reason really to be in downtown LA. Um, so it was kind of interesting to see how casual it's become, and some of my older colleagues were commiserating and saying, you know, they have all these expensive suits and ties in their closet that they rarely get a chance to, to wear anymore. The exception, again, would be if you go into court, uh, or if you're meeting you know, with clients and it's necessary to put forth the right image. But generally speaking, we see a lot more casual aspects in, in relation to dress attire. I think there's differentiation. If you go to, for example, New York or Washington, it tends to be a little more still um, buttoned down, let's say, than, than Los Angeles or San Francisco. Uh, but certainly in the time I've been in Romania, as I said, uh, 16 or 23 years, um, <laughs> That, that uh, we've seen even in the workplace that it's, it's less formalistic, certainly, than it was you know, in, the, in, the, in the late 90s. Okay, so if you want to ask Brian about his opinion on differences between West Coast and East Coast in US, feel free to do it in the break. I would turn to, to Mihaela. Mihaela, uh, how many percent, or how, what is the ratio of your clients that are applying dress code culture that you guys are uh, consulting with? Applying dress code. So the, all the clients, all the companies that you guys are pr uh, providing HR services to, when you, when you see them, when you meet, mm -hmm. when you understand their company culture, how much dress code driven are they? Uh, unfortunately, I would say that the majority of them are dress code driven. Um, only the creative industries, <coughs> they are free to dress as they want. And uh, a Harvard study shows that whenever people dress casual, they are more productive. This is why I never understood the imposed dress code. Can you, can you explain to me why am I getting more productive if I'm dressed casually? What, what, what's the difference? Because your focus is on what you need to achieve, not on how you look. Okay, so if I get this I correctly... I mean, if I spend a half, uh, one hour uh, in the morning uh, thinking about how will I get dressed for ABSL because it's a dress code, I'm just losing my time. Who spends more than 30 minutes this morning on the dressing for today? You should ask women. <laughs> Ladies? <laughs> Colin. And, and, and look at the gentleman over there. It really makes a difference, right? Could you imagine, He's Colin? He's British. I mean, <laughs> they know they know how to dress. You know, it's it's in their DNA. Could you I guys mean, ever with imagine? us, we are just imitating. I can't imagine Colin dressed like undressed, let's say, in terms of <laughs> dress code in a conference, inappropriately dressed. Let's call it. It's about 11 o'clock this evening. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll find out. <laughs> All right. Send me the address, please. <laughs> uh, I would go back a bit uh, on this point, uh, Andre. Mihaila is saying that people get less productive because they focus on how to dress and, now, and not on how to achieve their yeah. task. What and, would you uh, just think about Just a second. Ju just a small uh, note, side. Uh, and they do not feel comfortable when they need, when they are, it's imposed to dress in a certain manner. Okay. It's not their choice. All right. Right. So given the fact people, are, some of them are not comfortable on what they're supposed to dress, but they need to still dress like that in the morning, Mihaila is saying that they will get less productive 
than the others. What do you think about Look, this? First, first of all, I think it took you less than two minutes to get dressed this morning because once you uh, figure out how to wear a suit, it's super quick and super fast. But what, what, I'm, what I don't get from Mihaela is that uh, there's a lot of... Um, I mean, a lot of us look at dress code as if it's something that it's very bad as in, it, and is it, it is imposed. But once you understand it properly and you, f you make it your own and you make it to suit your personality, it does, it, you don't do it just because somebody else told you. So it becomes natural and you can actually use it to feel better in your own, uh, in your own skin. Mm -hmm. I'm imagining a bit of a metaphor between dress code and chorba de fasola, right? When people get older, <laughs> especially at the young age, they don't really like it. But when they get older, they start to like it. It's like about dress code as well. No, the older you get, maybe you get <laughs> mature enough I, to... I think, I think it's Chorba de Burta, not Chorba de Fasole. But <laughs> not not if your attire resembles Chorba de Fasole when you're done. Sorry, say again? Not if you look like a Chorba de Fasole when you're done. <laughs> Dragos, please also keep the mic. Uh, I would like to also ask your opinion on this. No good deed goes unpunished. Do you have any people in your organization uh, coming to you that they would feel much more free and productive if they didn't have the dress code when certain occasions you guys are having the dress code? Considering that, well, the company where I work for in Stefanini, we don't have like a very strict dress code. There's certain things that are prohibited, which are, well, you know, no Nazi symbols, no stuff like that, which is pretty normal, yeah? Other than that, we encourage people to you know dress the way they want and the way they, they feel good and of course dress for the occasion again when there's a reason to be to be in a business attire that's fine we do it and we do it by choice nobody has to tell us nobody had to call me from Stefanini and tell me I have to be in a suit today okay. <laughs> I chose to be in a suit today you know it's from I'm not side. happy about it but yeah, I chose to <laughs> <laughs> Brian can I ask you a question and uh, let's imagine a situation that uh, someone would a good headhunter would approach you tomorrow, let's say, and then someone would uh, offer you a job that you would take, which uh, the job would be heading a legal department of a huge shared service BP organization in-house. So you would actually belong to the business service sector officially. Um, you are a guy who likes dress code and you are obviously well-dressed. Um, how would you make the transformation? How would you tackle that situation that those people in your department uh, in terms of dressing? I think if I were in-house in a like a shared services, then I think the emphasis on, on, on dress code would not be as important because I think it would depend if you're servicing, if the only client you're servicing is essentially as an in-house team, you're servicing the company, um, then your interaction with your fellow uh, non-legal staff should be as dictated by the company uh, dress code. Where I have an issue with the dress code is, again, being in the private sector where you're dealing with a multitude of clients. So I think I would be more relaxed, let's say, on a dress code approach if it were an in-house situation. And I think there I would defer to whatever the policies were of the company. And again, to the, uh, to the point that was made about being more comfortable, if people are more comfortable, as long as it's you know not over the top, then I wouldn't have a problem with that. I would note, though, um, on the comfort issue, that for me, putting on a suit and tie somehow delineates when I'm not working when I am. And I, I give an example. When I first came to Romania, I was working in an apartment right next to the apartment I lived in. And yet every morning I would get up and I would put on a jacket and tie when I went to work because I knew I was going to be meeting people. I was advising uh, different people that were in different sectors in the government and, and the judiciary. And it was just, I would not feel comfortable feeling like I was at work if I was in jeans and a t-shirt. And in some instances, even if I didn't have meetings, you never knew if there were going to be meetings. And it just felt right for me. And I realized maybe that sounds odd, but it was almost like putting on your suit of armor, you know, before you go to battle. So. Um, for me, it would be, I'm less comfortable actually if I'm in a working environment, unless I'm working from home or I say, look, I'm not coming in this afternoon because I want to stay home and do some drafting or phone calls or whatever. But generally speaking, I, I, f I feel that it, it, it just helps me to, you know, sort of feel like I'm in the work environment and put mm -hmm. my, my work uh, head on, so to speak. Um, but to your question, yeah, I would be more relaxed given, given the different circumstances. So if it's a back office role where you have little interaction with uh, clients directly and more within an organization, then, then I don't think you would need, for example, to have a full suit and tie every day. So it's not necessarily the job function that this defines if it's dress code or not. It's more like the industry and the sector. Yeah, I, I agree. So in a, crea in a creative industry, I understand and you, know, you wouldn't expect if uh, you had a web designer, for example, that he's mm -hmm. going to show up in a full suit and tie. But if you have somebody who is going into court to argue a case you know, and the client's paying large sums of money, if you show up in you know, torn jeans and a t-shirt, you kind of kick back, you know, vaping, 
I think it's going to be a problem. What I paid for, yeah. yeah. Uh, one question with Andre, we were discussing separately, I think, a few days ago. Then we were touching on a topic Andre expressed, but correct if I understood wrong. But dress code, applying dress code, is also a question of emotional intelligence, in terms of people's adaptability. So to translate this in a very black and white and maybe a bit of a provocative way, is is that okay to translate that people who do not want to apply dress code, have an emotional intelligence and the sense of a, a bit, uh, adaptability in a lower level? Uh, I, don't, I don't think, um, I don't remember the, the discussion, I'm sorry, but um, I don't think dress code has anything to do with um, a low level of um, emotional intelligence. Um, I think it has to do with what's comfortable for you also mentally, as Brian was saying, for him it's much more comfortable to wear a suit than to wear a t-shirt and jeans. Um, and I, in the longer run, I think that might relate to emotional intelligence if you want to bring that up again, because um, you have to feel that the way you dress and the way you present yourself uh, suits you. But I really do believe that until you've explored the whole spectrum, like from t-shirt and, and uh, Bermuda, Bermudas to a full three-piece suit properly worn, until you've done all that spectrum, you cannot properly say that one is good or the other is good. Okay. So I Sorry for that. Let's just have a bit of a snap at, at here and turn to another topic, which is about differences between generations. And what want to ask Dragos on this uh, first. Dragos, uh, we have agreed to discuss this topic as people above 30 and people below 30 years. As we know also from the KPMG uh, studies that this is the youngest sector, the youngest population is in the business services sector. What do you feel, what is the biggest challenge coming from the people below 30 that they are posing for the older generation? Right, so my experience as a hiring manager, I would say, um, is that people below 30 don't put as much value on career, and again, not a generalization for those two of you in the in the room that are now aiming to stab me. Um, so, uh, yeah, they don't put as much emphasis on their career. They have a more like follow your dreams mentality. The job is just a place where they collect a paycheck that enables them to follow their dreams. We, so, not a lot of interest in career and career development. Not as much as I, I would say I've seen with the other generations that they have in front of me. Mm -hmm. Mihaela, do you agree with this? People below 30 are not really taking I career as serious as they I do. always agree with Dragos, okay. but um, it's a joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what I want to say uh, before I answer your question is that there is a book that is called Passages, The Predictable uh, Life Crisis. And the book is um, about the four uh, passages that we all live, if we live long, uh, is what we do in our 20s, what we aim for, and that is exploring life. It's we feel that we are larger than life in our 20s, we are more courageous. Then in the 30s, we are, it's the most stressful period of one's life because you are juggling with many roles, uh, having a career, a family, kids, uh, house, uh, proving to everybody that you are worth it. Then in the 40s, you look back and you say, mm, so what have I done? It's the assessment period and the reassessment. Sometimes you get depressed because you have this feeling that you uh, were reaching somebody else's goals, like the society goals, the expectations of your parents, spouse, and so on. And then finally, the good news is that in the 50s, we are in our adventurous phase. We feel finally free. Okay. So, if we go back to uh, the KPMG study that uh, the majority of the people working in this industry are uh, mid-20s, mid-30s, uh, what they want, if we talk about 20 to 30 is they want to explore. 
whether it's dress code, whether it's work style, whether it's gathering knowledge, it's they want to feel free. So do I understand that you, you, you mentioned about the cycles, the people who are in the 50s, let's say, and the people who are in the 25 to 35, they basically they want the, the same thing, freedom. Um, so they have uh, a lot in common. If, if we take the book that applies whenever, it doesn't matter the generation, it's 20s is 20s, you want freedom, you want to explore, you want to feel larger than life. When we talk about 30s, it's totally different. You need to prove to build a career, to build a family, uh, to raise kids and so on. So there are two different stages. It's Z and millenniums okay. and they, they have different drivers. So let's go back to the question. To the 20s. Yep. Uh, if you are in your 20s, you want to explore life. You want to stay in a company for one year, one year and a half at most. You want instant feedback because the way you you got raised is by a click away. So that click away is your requirement regarding everything. Instant feedback in the workplace, uh, instant payment uh, raise, everything has to be fast, fast, fast. Okay. And the way you get dressed is like, let me express the way I feel. Putting this together with what Drago said, that people in these early ages, they are not really taking their career as a top priority in terms of career aspirations. How does it come together with your philosophy on the people in their 20s? I think that they have different values compared to our to when I was in my 20s. They are searching freedom and meaning and whatever they do has to be meaningful. In the past for the X generation and the baby boomers it everything was related to not everything but the majority of our life was related to proving to getting material success, getting a career and so on. With the younger generation nowadays, they are seeking meaning. Their values are very different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Brian, how does it go down in a law firm? If someone joins us at early 20 years old, right? And just uh, finishes the school, gets to your law firm. Do they work on meaningful projects? Do they work on meaningful activities from the beginning? Because that's obviously... Yeah, I mean, I would like to think it's all meaningful. I mean, they're not going to maybe go into court and argue the, f the case as lead counsel, but at a beginning point, they'll be working on actual, um, on, on actual matters of substance that are important for a client. And uh, I just wanted to address a point which, which was raised, and I agree with that. I think that if you look at the workforce now, I recall, you know, when, when I was graduating law school, when you were a, a young associate, when the partner, you know, you were interviewing for a position, you, the first question wasn't, you know, what's your vacation policy or, you know, how early can I split to go to the beach? Um, you just didn't do that. You worked all the time. You worked, you know, if the partner said jump, you said how high. And there was definitely this, uh, it was very much driven by the generation at that time, which had the reins, which were even the pre-baby boomers. If you look at it, they were maybe uh, phasing out, but the younger baby boomers, or excuse me, the older baby boomers who were born in the 40s and 50s would have been those those folks in, 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 in positions of power. And they, they came of age in a time where, again, it was very much uh, performance oriented. And I think now, in, when I look at young lawyers who are coming to the firm and, and, and interviewing for positions, there is much more of an emphasis on this sort of, let's call it quality of life concerns. So they want to know, you know, can they, how many weeks vacation do they get? What's the policy on working on the weekends? Can they work from home, uh, remote working and things of this nature, which were again, never issues for the, I think, earlier generations. And even speaking of folks that we would be hiring in the late 90s or early 2000s in Romania, you've seen that generational change. Again, the, the, the lawyers at that time that you would be interviewing would be much more uh, goal-oriented and uh, much more focused on, on being able to demonstrate success through material possessions or, or indicators of success. And I think the, the younger generation uh, that we see now, the millennials or the Z generation, um, they're definitely, as, as you said, um, much more motivated by other concerns and, and less, uh, let's say, looking more for immediate gratification or immediate feedback. Mm -hmm. How does it come together? Um, it's very interesting. What Mihaila touched upon is that people uh, are spending less and less time with their job, with their employer. It's interesting. Seven years ago, we have conducted a survey about what is the typical and desirable time that employees would spend with the same employer. And the answer was typically five years. 
this is obviously very different nowadays, especially looking at the business services sector where getting up to speed, being productive is, takes much shorter time than in engineering or IT sector, for example. Um, what do you think, Dragos, in terms of this question as we ask you someone, and now put yourself basically in the shoes of an employee, what is the ideal years that you would think to spend with a company? And not think about yourself, because obviously you've been with your company for a long time, but what, what advice do you give to a youngster? How many years? Have enough patience to get bored of your job, I would say. I mean, don't leave whenever you get the opportunity to go for, I don't know, 5% raise to another company. That's not the way to do it. How many Cause, percent? Because cause you, cause you, cause you end up spending your time in a continuous loop where you do the same thing for an extra 5%. That's not really worth it. That's not career building. That's, you know, just Put going for extra cash. Putting this in contrary with the reality, out of 100 employees in the sector, how many employees would you think they would just leave for that 5%? Because I understand your advice is that basically stay until you get you get more and more from the company. But if you look You're at the reality... You're asking me to pull, a, to pull a percent out of a hat and I can't do that. I, I've never done a study for that. But, yeah. What's I, your best guess? I can only answer by this is happening a lot more often today than it did 10 years ago. Okay. Yeah, I can answer you like that. Okay. And by the way, 50 is the age of exploring? Starting with... <laughs> The adventurous phase. Exploring arthritis. That's. Sorry? So arthritis, arthri 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 yeah, you know, like pain yeah, in yeah, joints, yes, yeah. yeah, and exploring. Yeah, you can do joints now. Wow. <laughs> let's, let's get to a business model related question. Brian, in, in, in your organization, uh, where obviously getting people up to productivity takes typically longer than in other more transactional industries, what, I what is the business model? How many years of uh, return do you calculate when you take on a new colleague? Well, we hope that they'll stay for a long period of time because we do invest a lot of time and effort in training uh, even beyond law school. So we have uh, internal trainings. Uh, we also are investing them with the brand and, and, and uh, uh, exposing them to clients. And so the hope is that we'll be building somebody who'll work their way through the organization. In, in reality, what we see is many of the younger associates do go through this exploration phase where maybe they decide we've had some just say, look, you know what, I don't think law is for me. So they've actually left the profession. Um, and I think that generally we, we see that the average, most of the associates will stay with us for four or five years and on average, but you know, then maybe they'll go in-house or they'll lateral to another law firm, or as I mentioned, they may just decide to drop out of the profession altogether. But the hope is that we're fortunate that we have quite a bit of stability in our firm locally. So for example, all the partners we've worked together for more than a decade um, and with many of the senior associates and counsel, it's the same. So we, at the higher levels, you tend to find more stability. And I think, um, as was said as by Dragos, I think most of them are investing in the career and they could make more money across the street, but they don't really want to upend their professional lives for an extra 5%. They feel like they've also invested in the brand. And it's sometimes the devil you know, uh, or you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. There's always that... Uh, dilemma as well. But I think generally we're fortunate that in our industry at least you tend to have maybe more stability than other, maybe more creative industries where yeah. people, um, you know, like in the computer and software where they can move around very much the brand is themselves. Okay. Andre, you are in entrepreneurial area, so not on the corporate world, let's say in this way. Um, how is your approach that other people, especially the young people, how is their approach towards the entrepreneurial? How much entrepreneurship arising you see in the Romanian market? Look, I'm just turning 30, so I think I'm somewhere in... W turning 30 meaning it's going to become very difficult for me from now on, right? The next 10 years is going to be like super shitty. Okay, I get it. The most now, stressful you, you, period No, 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 no it will be okay. Most you have a family, you will get a credit from a bank okay. to build a house. I mean, hey. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully not the credit, but... Um, look, I think that... Uh, I, I agree with Mihail uh, what, she, what she was saying, but I think that I would add an extra layer of meaning, which is I do find a lot of people are coming to work with me even for less money if you if you can actually give them the meaning that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. value-wise, mm -hmm. I don't think that people are actually looking for an extra 5% anymore, especially in my generations or even younger generations. And the entrepreneurial part, I think there's a lot of young people who are super driven to work and to build their own businesses as uh, long as they feel it's their own somehow also. So corporate-wise, I think 
it's a bit different. I don't really understand that as, as well. But I see a lot of young people who want to, to be entrepreneurs and they work like 16 hours a day, 17 hours a day for very low amounts of money because it's their business and there's their values. Uh, Dragos, you mentioned about this 5% more money and then we were picking up on this, right? About people. If I would have said six, you would have all said six. So, yeah. It so was a random number. And yeah, it's all right. So, Andre is saying about entrepreneur world is not really a common happening. However, you said in the corporate world, it's really happening. How much responsibility do you think large corporates have this? having this kind of happening, or is it more about the generation topic? I mean, obviously, market competition is always healthy, and yeah, we... Market we competition happens yeah, also we, in entrepreneurship. We all, we all support the free market, but yeah, in, in entrepreneurial environments, I'm assuming it doesn't happen that often, because when you're personally invested in a project, you tend to see it to the end. It's, um, I don't know. You get the credit, you get the family, you get the whole thing. <laughs> Yeah, the credit, but also um, it's this human stubbornness that defines all of us. That once you start a project, you have to finish it, and it doesn't matter how many bumps you hit along the road. So I guess that's it. If you feel like the project is properly yours, I mean, I don't think that that value of I've started something, I'm going to finish it, applies to our generations as much mm -hmm. as it used to. But if you feel it's yours, like I, I chose this, I started it, I want to finish it, then for sure, it's as you're, as you're saying. If you want to go into a debate about private property, I'm happy to go there, but I don't think it's the, the right scene right now. As a final thought, could you explain, either of you, uh, any initiative or any good example of programs when people are encouraged to do a more entrepreneurial attitude in large corporations, which would still drive those people to stay with the organization without changing from a corporate to an entrepreneur side? You are talking about entrepreneurship? being yep. an entrepreneur within the, the yes. a corporation. So those kind of projects when people can express their willingness to do that and thus they would stay with the company longer. Uh, I, I think that if people are allowed to be entrepreneurs, they will be more loyal to the company and more happy. Now, if the question is, if any, this any is exact happening, any examples that you can say, maybe, uh, or Dragos, you can say, I maybe. I cannot give names, but uh, I didn't check with the clients. Uh, they are the creative industries. They are the unicorns type of companies. They are into such things. When, uh, from the moment you have an idea until the moment you can implement it, it's very short. So I'm just conscious a bit of the time because we have up, but yeah. Dragos has some examples I could see. Uh, you don't need to be in a creative profile to have your own entrepreneurial role in your corporation. You can be a subject matter expert. You can be given a certain topic and like, psh, good luck, learn it, develop it. It's your department, it's your role, go ahead with it. And yeah, I've seen quite a few examples uh, nourish and flourish along the years. In this industry? Yeah, in our industry, like in a big corporation. Like different departments that started from zero and are currently, you know, growing within the company, and the result of the work of one guy, essentially. All right, I think we are done with the time. Thank you, everyone, for the patience and the attention, and thank you guys for taking our invitation. Thank you.